Howdy. After the last two videos, hopefully you now understand the process of how we're going to do simple harmonic motion, and let's see how we attack a curveball that was thrown one year. That way, if they throw a curveball at y'all, that you're still going to be okay. So let's take a look at this third one. It says that a mouse of mass m naught, so mouse is a mass m naught, uh, is sitting on a block of mass m which is attached to a spring of spring constant k. So there's some spring constant k. At time moment t equals zero, the mouse jumps off the block with a velocity v not directed to the left. There is no friction between the block and the table. And in part a, find the position of the block as a function of time after the jump. That's cool. So here's the thing. Your initial position for simple harmonic motion is zero. In this situation, your x naught is zero because after the mouse jumps off, that's whenever it begins to go back and forth and back and forth. And so this time you have to have an initial velocity. But the initial velocity of this block is not v naught. v naught was a velocity of the mouse when it jumped to the left. And so your initial velocity of the simple harmonic motion will be the final velocity of momentum between the mouse and the block, okay? And so if you do p naught equals pf, initially both were just chilling out. Initially there was no momentum. But then the mouse with the mass m naught jumped off with some v naught. And then the... Uh, block went with some mass, went some vx, I don't know what vx is, that's what we're solving for. vx is going to be a negative m naught v naught over m. And this is your initial velocity of simple harmonic motion. And so therefore, now that I have that, now let's go through that process. I needed to do that first, because remember, what was the first thing I did in the last two is I found my initial position and my initial velocity of simple harmonic motion. But last time, they just explicitly gave it to us. Here I needed to find my initial velocity. Okay, so now going through that process, we know that fx is equal to max, and that fx is equal to the only force acting on this block is your spring, so negative kx, is equal to m times your second derivative position with respect to t. So once again, I get the d2x dt squared is negative kx over m. I'm going to put that off to the side and utilize that later to find my omega. Now first, I'm going to find a. In order to do that, I give you the solution to my diffy q, a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. But here's the thing, your initial position of simple harmonic motion in this instance is zero. So that means that your a is zero, okay? Next, I find velocity by taking the derivative of position with respect to t. So that's b omega cosine omega t but this time your initial velocity is going to be a negative m naught over m v naught, and that's equal to b times omega, so b is negative m naught v naught over m omega. I don't know what omega is, but I'll, I'll solve for that later, but this is what b is going to be. Finally, acceleration is simply the derivative of velocity with respect to t, so taking the derivative of velocity, that's a negative b omega squared sine omega t, which, of course, is our second derivative of position. So that's where this comes into play. I replace my second derivative of position with respect to t. I replace that with a negative kx over m. And so I have that negative b omega squared sine omega t is negative kx over m, where your x is b sine omega t, right? Your a is 0. Your x is going to be, be sine omega t. I can't use my a of 0 this time. I can't use my acceleration at t equals 0 because sine of 0 is 0. So that doesn't help me. At 0, x is 0. So I get 0 equals 0. Congratulations. It doesn't tell me anything. However, I do know my position as a function of time is b sine omega t. And so I have my negative b omega squared sine omega t is equal to negative k. My x is b sine omega t over m. Notice how the b sine omega t's end up canceling. 
you get that omega squared is k over m. That's where I get my omega is the square root of k over m. And now that you have a, now that you have b, now that you have omega, now you can find your position as a function of time. And so finding your position as a function of time, this is equal to b, which is negative, uh, m naught v naught over m omega, sine square root of k over m times t. If you want to replace that omega with the square root k over m, be my guest, but there is your final answer. Now that I've got that for part A, let's take a look at part B. Part B says, how long will it take for the block to return to its equilibrium position? In essence, when will x equal 0? Well, x is going to equal 0 when sine omega t is equal to 0. But when is sine equal to 0? When's the first time sine is equal to 0 after you start? That's at pi. Okay? Yeah, I know sine of 0 is equal to 0 at 0, but that doesn't help me. It says, how long will it take for the block to return to equilibrium position? Of course, at t equals 0, I'm at 0. I've told you that. That's your initial position. But the next time it's at 0 is going to be when the inside is equal to pi. We know omega is the square root of k over m, and so t is just pi times the square root of m over k. In essence, when we divide pi a fraction, multiply by that fraction flipped, and then finally for part C, find the total mechanical energy. Find the total me mechanical energy in the block and show that it does not depend on time. Okay, so we know that our total mechanical energy is going to be potential energy plus kinetic energy. Now we know that the potential energy of a spring is one-half kx squared, and we know that kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. Now we saw earlier that x is equal to b sine omega t, and we saw that v is the derivative of that, that's going to be b omega cosine omega t. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace my x with b sine omega t, and I'll replace my v with b omega cosine omega t. And so, because you really don't need this anymore. And so putting that into there, this is going to be 1 half k. Now your x, x squared is going to be b squared sine squared omega t plus 1 half m, and then v squared is going to be b squared omega squared cosine squared omega t. Now if you remember, omega was the square root of k over m. And so omega squared would be k over m times cosine squared omega t. Okay, And so notice how in this case my m's are going to cancel. And so what I have is that this is going to be 1 half k b squared sine omega t plus this will be a 1 half k b squared cosine squared, this is sine squared, cosine squared omega t, which notice you can factor out a 1 half k b squared. I can factor out a 1 half k b squared and this is going to be sine squared omega t plus cosine squared omega t, which, as you should know, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, so that's equal to 1 half kb squared. Your total mechanical energy is always conserved. It doesn't depend how long after it's traveled, so long as there's no friction. It only depends on the amplitude, that's your b, and k, your spring constant. Good luck on your final exam, and join me in the, I guess in our website, where we'll have all of the practice tests, test reviews, final exam reviews that you would need in order to ace this course.